So about two years ago, a friend of mine had moved into his own apartment. The sofa that was in it was old and worn, so he decided that he would try and find one in better condition. He asked me to help him look for one as my dad had a van and we would need to use that to transport the sofa. So we went on Craigslist to have a look at what other people had for sale. We came across one ad that stated, Three-seater cream leather sofa, great condition, free to first viewer. There was a picture of it and it looked in perfect condition. Now the ads had been up for a week so we had thought that maybe it was already gone and that they just hadn't taken the ad down yet. So my friend contacted the seller and nearly instantly got a reply saying that they still had the sofa and it was available if we could collect it. I was a bit wary that it was still available, I mean, a free sofa in perfect condition that had been up for a week and nobody had taken it yet? We thought that maybe there was something wrong with it that could only be noticed when viewing the sofa that was maybe hidden from the pictures. It was a weekend and we had no plans, so we decided that we would go and check out the sofa my friend contacted the seller back and organized a time and place to meet up. They decided on a local McDonald's car park at 9pm as the seller said that he was in work until about 8pm and would need time to get ready after work. The seller said that he would be driving a green Honda Accord with a trailer. So he pulled up to the McDonald's car park at about 8.50pm. There was loads of people around so we had no reason to think that we would be in danger or anything. At about 8.55, my friend got a text saying that the seller was about 15 minutes away and they asked him to describe what vehicle we were in, so he described the van that we were in to him. About five minutes after he had texted the seller what vehicle we were in, an overweight man and around 50 years old with a gray scruffy beard and greasy gray hair approached the driver's side window of the van, which was my side as I was driving the van. He was wearing a plain white t-shirt with what looked like food stains all over it with black jeans with holes torn in them and dried mud stains all over them along with a pair of black steel toe cap boots also covered in dried mud. He knocked on my window so I rolled it down a bit. You boys here for the sofa? He said in a gravelly voice. It sounded like he needed to cough but couldn't get it out. Uh, yeah? I said to him. Rob's car had broken down just down the road and his phone battery had died. I was with him and I walked up to get you guys. He's with the car waiting for AAA, but you can come down and collect the sofa off of him. Me and my friend looked at each other, unsure of what to think. Can I get in the van and we'll just uh, go back to Rob together? The guy asked. Uh, how far down the road is he? I asked before he replied. Mm, not too far, but I need to show you where to go. At this stage, my friend pretended to get a phone call. Hello? Yes? Oh, no way, really? Alright, well, we'll be right there. He said before pretending to hang up his phone. He looked at me and said, We gotta go. My dad needs us to help him with a flat tire. I nodded, knowing that it was a fake call, just to get us away from this creepy guy. We gotta go now, but we'll contact you tomorrow about the sofa. The guy just stared at us as I rolled up my window and started to drive away. Me and my friend looked at each other like, That was creepy. I got bad vibes off of that guy. My friend said, Yeah, definitely. We decided to drive around the back of the car park to see if we could find out if the guy was up to something or not. We could see him standing in the same spot where we left him and he was on the phone. He put his phone down and about two minutes after that a car pulled up with three men in it and he got in. My friend's phone started ringing and it was the number of Rob, the guy who was supposedly giving away the sofa. He answered, Hey, uh, can you meet tomorrow and I can hold onto the sofa for you until then? As he was on the phone, I noticed one of the men in the car that had collected the creepy guy was also on the phone. My friend told Rob that he would contact him tomorrow and that he was busy and couldn't talk right now. At the same time that my friend hung up the phone, the guy who was in the car also finished his phone call. At this point, I explained to my friend that there was probably no car that had broken down and that creepy guy was trying to lure us somewhere so 
the guys in the car could do God knows what to us. We drove home and my friend blocked the number of Rob and we never heard from them again. We reported the ad and it was removed the next day. Since the moment I started working at this restaurant six months ago, the alleyway behind the restaurant has always given me an uncomfortable feeling. To gain a layout of this restaurant, it's located in the middle of downtown, five minutes from the Mexican-US borders since we're located in the tip of Texas in the Rio Grande Valley. The alley itself is not located right behind the establishment. You must walk past its patio, then past our garage, and till you reach the side back door that you have to prop open as the door locks behind you once it's closed. During the day, I'll usually see people walking back and forth across the alley when I go to take out the trash. It's typically a safe location, though it is also prominent for its homeless population. They're usually harmless, despite a few that are noticeably mentally ill. My colleagues have even gotten to know a few and have given leftovers whenever possible. I work as part of the kitchen staff at this restaurant and most of the time will work past 10 p.m. At night, my boss usually never lets the women take out the trash just to be safe, especially a petite, five-foot, Hispanic, 28-year-old female. Anyway, since the lockdown started, our kitchen staff had become quite small, so I'll usually help take out the trash with one of the other men working. This night was pretty slow, and my fellow co-workers and I were encouraged to clean up and leave early. At around a quarter to ten, I decided to get two of the slightly full trash bags and take them out back myself, assuming someone will see my actions and take the other two after me. As I walked past the patio to the garage, my gut began to fluster. I got to the back door and paused. Hmm, maybe I should wait, I told myself, but the smell protruding from the bags was nauseating. I pushed the door and propped it open with a brick we usually kept nearby. The alley was dark and silent. The air felt menacing. The only light illuminating was from the bulb above the door. I walked quickly to the bins and lifted up the top and dumped the trash. Then, slowly, a man stood up from the other side of the dumpster. He wasn't very big, but he looked a lot older. He was sweating, but his demeanor seemed agitated. He must have been crouching and waiting for some time. I jumped back, holding my hand above my heart that seemed to be pulsing through my chest. The man looked at me eyeing me as my steps moved backward. He shook his head, motioning me to stop. He was far too close for me to outrun him. I looked at his bushy dark brows and dark black eyes. Most of him were still cloaked in the night that surrounded us. His clothes didn't look homeless, but I still assumed he was since it was common for them to be out here at this hour usually waiting for food. I told him I had no leftovers, but he shook his head again and took out a medium-sized knife. My eyes widened as I took in a breath. The following exchange took place in Spanish, but I'll translate. I don't have my purse. I was working. I'm still working. Just come with me, he said, using his knife as a pointer. My mouth grimaced. Having no idea where this small amount of courage came from, I said, My friend's coming right now with the rest of the trash. No, come now he said more hurriedly and stepped closer and I stepped back again, speaking again with a little more tenacity. They all saw me come out here, there's more trash and he's coming right now. He's outside right now, I just, all I need to do is yell. You're not gonna scream. I'll gut ya. To this day, I don't know what came over me, but I replied with, watch me. We looked at each other, daring each other and we both heard footsteps coming from inside the garage, and he ran past me. I stood there, breathing again. I didn't even know how I was holding my breath. I turned to see my friend, John, come out of the door. We're almost done over... He stopped after seeing my face. What happened? I explained everything as tears ran down my face. My friend decided to run down the alley to try to catch him, even though I told him not to, and that he's gone by now. It was about five minutes until we came back. John relayed to me that no one was around except for some homeless guys we were familiar with. 
He asked them if they saw anyone running from the alleyway, and they said yeah, but they didn't recognize the man, and he took off in the opposite direction towards the border. John took me back inside and told her boss what had happened. They called the cops whose station was pretty close by. They sent someone to patrol the area and gather a description from me which I gave. My boss let me leave early and John walked me to my car. He told me it's too bad we don't keep a camera back there. It would have been cool to see how I handled the guy. I smiled slightly but my stomach was still in knots. He looked at me and apologized. I moved my hand to stop him and told him I'll be fine. Unfortunately, I still work there, but I've been excused from trash duty from now on. Obviously, they never found him. I don't want to think about what would have happened to me if I was more complicit. Something gave me the courage to argue back to him and thank God that my friend came out just in time. So, to start, I'm a transgender woman. I'm single and I make my status as trans very clear on all my dating profiles, except plenty of fish because they consider that to be talking illicitly and they will straight up ban you, so I state and said that I'm a huge proponent of trans rights. So this guy messaged me, he lives about an hour away, kind of cute in a mildly creepy way, like Something seems a little off about him, but people can't help how they look, so I give him a chance, just like I would want. I discover he's a smoker, but he says he's trying hard to quit and only does when he's really stressed or upset. We have a nice conversation and finally ask for my number, and without thinking about it, I give him the number but tell him I'm getting ready for my evening classes, so I'll be slow to respond. A few minutes go by and I get, hey, it's him from POF, Plenty of Fish. Now usually I send standard quick messages like, hi, it's Ali, so just to be clear since my profile might be a little vague, I am a trans woman, I know that's not everyone's cup of tea, so if you're not interested I completely understand. About 20% of the time the guy isn't interested and gets rude and needs to be blocked and the other 80% is split between immediate inappropriate questions and certain pictures casual acceptance or dead silence. But like I said, I was getting ready to go to class so I hadn't sent the message yet. A few minutes go by and I'm about to text him my standard when I get another text. Who the F is? And saying my full dead name. Why is he paying your cell phone bill? Where did you even get that name? I ask. Answer the question, who is he? I'm honestly stunned at this point and I realized he must have paid one of those shady websites that offer personal info for a fee. Well, if you must know, I'm trans and that used to be my name. I was about to tell you when you pulled that stunt. Please do us both a favor and lose my number. It's incredibly invasive and I don't want to talk to you anymore. Do you still live that? And he listed my address in my hometown. I'm coming to see you so we can talk about this in person. Me, lying... No, I moved a few months ago and I'm getting ready to head out like I said. You need to leave me alone. Don't contact me again. Since you have something to hide, I'm going to run a full background check on you. You lied to me and I don't appreciate that. I'm sending screen caps of this conversation. Your plenty of fish profile and your photos to my two best friends who work in law enforcement in your town and my ex-boyfriend who I'm still on good terms with who works for the local sheriff's office. Don't text me again. I didn't hear anything else from him for a few weeks. I made sure my doors and windows were locked and the aforementioned friends and ex would check up on me from time to time. Eventually it just became one of those weird things that makes you laugh uneasily. And then one day I thought I saw him at the local grocery store. Same dark hair, thick glasses frames and just a creepy guy staring at me, watching me as I shopped. I texted my ex about it, and as an upswing on things, my ex and I got back together in a casual sort of way, and he stayed the night a few times a month, off and on. One night, when I was alone, though, I just kept getting this weird feeling and smelling smoke. I lived in a little apartment complex that were three separate apartments that shared walls, but no plumbing or air ducts. I don't smoke, and I'm very sensitive to the smell thanks to asthma. 
The apartment had a wall unit AC, so I turned it off since it was apparently pulling air in from a neighbor's guest who must have been chain smoking, so I thought. I had an ASL video due the next morning, so I was up all night practicing and recording the video, signing the same story over and over again until it was almost a dance rather than a narration. A couple of times I had to restart the video because my cat was going nuts. Finally at around 7am I had the video finished and sent in and was ready for bed so I double checked all the doors and windows that they were locked, set an alarm and went to sleep. I woke up and got ready for school, was running a bit late and had to hurry out the door but I noticed something weird but didn't have time to stop and register it. Classes went smoothly, I got an A on my ASL video and I stopped for groceries on my way home from class. As I got home I saw what had been bugging me. Each apartment had a small garden on each side of the porch. Mine was nothing but gravel and pavers the previous tenant had put in but it was tidy except for a pile of cigarette butts that had looked like someone had dumped their car ashtray in my garden. There was no other trash, just that pile, right in front of my bedroom window. I don't think anything about it at first and just get a broom and dustpan and sweep it up. As I'm doing it, my neighbor, an old man, comes out and asks if my boyfriend never got a hold of me. I ask him what he means. He tells me there was a young man waiting for me on my front porch off and on for a few hours last night and that he'd seen the guy around before and thought he was my boyfriend. I asked what he looked like. Dark hair, thick glasses, chain smoking. I text the on again off again ex. Cops take statements and I give them the screenshots. I move out of state a few weeks later for unrelated reasons and have legally changed my name since with closed records. I don't give guys my number anymore. Ladies and my fellow queer family use a texting app until you get to know someone because for like five dollars, creeps can get everything from your number. When I was about eight years old, my parents were going through a divorce and me and my older sister used to spend a lot of time at our grandparents' house. It's a long ranch style home on a corner in a very nice neighborhood that's a ten minute walk from a gas station, grocery store and a few fast food restaurants. The streets are long and lined with well-manicured houses cradled by big scenic California Valley Hills all around. We were never very wealthy, but my grandpa bought it as a fixer-upper many years ago, and the property value had skyrocketed since then. As you can imagine, it's a very safe spot, and although there weren't many other kids in the neighborhood, it wasn't uncommon to see neighbors walking their dogs or pushing a stroller down the sidewalk outside our house. Although my mom was especially protective all our lives, this particular neighborhood was densely populated and my family knew just about everyone who lived there. She grew up in that neighborhood herself, so she was understandably trusting. She would once in a while let me and my sister walk to the Rotten Robbie gas station on the other end of the block to grab a snack. I would always get a ring pop and my sister would grab a three musketeers before we made our way back home. My sister was about 11 at the time and this small amount of freedom was a really big deal to us. Nothing compared to walking down the street all by ourselves in the summertime, laughing and joking around, a couple dollar bills in our pockets. I felt like I owned the world. The one oddity I ever noticed around the neighborhood was a small camper parked on the side of the road opposite to the gas station, right along the back side of the fence of another house. It sat there in the shade like a permanent fixture all the windows constantly covered by opaque beige curtains. I can't explain why, but it was always giving me this deep sense of foreboding when I'd pass it. I was almost positive someone was living inside it because, at times, I'd hear the air conditioning running as it sat stagnant in that same spot. The hairs on my neck would always stand on end as I passed it, particularly as I passed the camper door and I'd always keep an eye on it for the fear that one day it would swing open just as I came to pass by. I think what bothered me the most was a drawing taped to the door from inside. It was extremely messy, a sketch of odd lines and a brown colored pencil that was frustratingly indiscernible. I could see the outline of something, a vague shape, but could never make out what it was intended to be. 
I never had the nerves to stop and stare long enough to really investigate, but each time I walked by, I'd steal a glance. A year prior to the incident I'm about to describe, I was walking with my mom past the camper in the shade. We had just gone to the park nearby and, unfortunately, had to pass the camper before we could cross the street and continue walking. I didn't want to seem afraid, so I kept on walking right behind her and didn't object when she walked past it. This time I felt a little more brave. I was frustrated not being able to decipher the drawing for so long. While my mom was feet away, I stopped in front of the camper door and took a moment to really look at the drawing. Upon closer inspection, the paper was filthy. I remember doing a project in elementary school where we soaked printer paper in black coffee to make it look aged, and that's what it reminded me of. My mom walked on without noticing that I'd stopped following her, but my eyes stayed fixed on the indistinct mass of dirt cake scribbles until I could make out what looked to be a tiny malformed face. My stomach turned. I immediately felt cold and disgusted as my eyes trailed over the rest of the image. I didn't know what kind of creature it was at the time, but now I can look back and say that the drawing was a badly deformed fetus inside a mass of large, perfect circles like those made by a circular ring ruler. Its face was contorted as if in pain. It was so graphically disturbing and seemed to portray this odd sense of suffering that stuck with me for days. As a child, I didn't know how to process it, and the mental image still makes me sick to think about. I had never seen anything like it before. Adrenaline flooded my body and my chest hurt with fear, but I selfishly thought of my glorious little trips for ring pops and said absolutely nothing as I followed behind my mom. This was, in retrospect, a classically terrible idea. It's one of those things you scream at main characters in movies for. Ever since my ill feelings towards the camper had been elevated by the drawing on the door, I thought about it every time we drove by, and about a month later my mom once again graced us with several bucks and permission to walk down to Rotten Robbie and grab our respective snacks. I thought about telling my sister about what I'd seen on the way there, but she was older and braver and I was terrified she'd make me cross the street with her to check it out. It was a bright sunny day and I told myself with false certainty that nothing was going to happen. If I didn't acknowledge it, maybe it'd go away. We walked past the camper and it was thankfully uneventful. On the walk back, I was feeling more comfortable and was focused on fighting to open up my candy wrapper while my sister walked alongside me. We passed the camper a second time, but I didn't give it half as much a thought as the first time. I don't remember what we were talking about, but I recall being interrupted mid-sentence as my sister softly yet firmly said my name. There was a distinct fear in her voice that immediately set me on edge like a bucket of ice water. All my senses heightened and I became aware of everything, including the sound of haphazard footsteps about ten feet behind us. It was accompanied by a heavy rustling sound like a heavy backpack and nervously I half turned my head to look. A man with a long unkempt beard and wearing many layers of ragged clothing stood behind us, eyes unmistakably burning into our backs as he walked. His movements weren't normal. It was a drunken shuffle, like each of his feet were unimaginably heavy and needed to be moved one grand effort at a time. His shoulders were skewed, head tilted downward with a strange arch of his neck. I could hear his shoes scraping the gravel with every step, but rather than seeming genuinely intoxicated, it was as if he was intentionally meandering our direction like a zombie with a direct effort to frighten us. Behind him, I saw the camper door was wide open for the first time in all the years we'd spent living there and realized this was the man who had been living inside. He's following us, I choked out, my eyes filling with tears. My mind was spinning as I stared straight ahead again, the wide streets and sidewalks abnormally empty all around. My sister grabbed my hand. She squeezed it hard enough to hurt without looking my way, speaking carefully under her breath. On the count of three, we race home, she told me in a very serious tone of voice. I couldn't reply through the growing lump in my throat, but every single cell in my body understood we had to put some distance between us and this man as quickly as possible. She began to count steadily while we walked faster, and the most terrifying part is that he started running before we even had a chance to. 
He must have heard her directions to me and tried to get a head start by sprinting our direction before she got to three, but his footsteps were noisy and we bolted like deer the instant we heard him behind us. I'll never forget it. The chase felt like you imagine in your nightmares. The fear your pursuer is inches away from grabbing your arm or a fistful of your hair. I pictured myself being dragged into the van with nobody around to see or hear me. We ran so fast we didn't even have the breath to scream, and peering back behind me about ten seconds later I saw him running our direction with absolutely none of the impairment he showed with those zombie-like steps moments before. I think back on it now and he may have been deliberately pretending to be handicapped to lower our guard so we wouldn't start running. The thought is terrifying but I can't rationalize it any other way. We made it to our grandparents' house and, without looking behind us, yanked open the stubborn old door before slamming it closed and scrambling past their excited dogs to get as deep in the house as possible. I don't even think we locked it, as our main goal was getting within the line of sight of any adults as quickly as possible. My mom was talking to my grandpa at the table and gave us an amused look when we bounded into the living room. Since we were kids, Running around wasn't anything out of the ordinary and she didn't ask what happened as we collapsed on the couch and tried to catch our breath. The inside of the house felt so safe and felt in such good spirits that I didn't even want to bring up what had just happened. Like waking up from a nightmare you didn't want to talk about, I was desperate to go back to normalcy. I wanted to forget it entirely, to unwrap my candy and act like everything was completely normal for the sake of my own sanity and that's exactly what I did. I asked my sister a few years back if she remembered this incident, I'm 25 and she's 28 now, and her response was strange. She remembered immediately without the need for me to provide details, but she quickly waved it off and insisted he had to have been a bored homeless man looking to spook some kids walking home with no real intent to harm anyone. I don't know. I'd like to believe it was some innocent misunderstanding, but... Like they always say about gut feelings, they're rarely wrong. I feel in my soul that he wanted to hurt me and my sister that day. I never told her or anyone else about the strange drawing on the door, and I'm not sure if my sister saw the open door and connected him to the camper or not. It's one of my biggest regrets, as I would hate for any other children to have been less fortunate after innocently walking past the camper in the shade. I believe he may have chosen the spot between the park and gas station deliberately due to the number of children walking around the area. I never saw the camper again. I'm not proud of how I handled this and would encourage anyone who finds themselves in a similar situation to contact authorities immediately for the safety of others around. I don't know if maybe this whole story comes off as melodramatic but it was very real and very frightening in a way I can't forget. I finally decided to post what happened to me four years ago. At that time, I was 17 years old and I was living for a few years in a small house with my mom after my parents divorced six years ago. The house wasn't huge, but we had one floor with our bedrooms and a small garden. We also have a dog who isn't really scary, it's one of those small dogs with a lot of hair. His biggest default is that he barks a lot during the day every time someone is close to the garden. That annoyed me and my neighbors a lot. It's important to know that my dog never barks at night and always sleeps in my bed with me. One night in the middle of the night I had a dream where I heard a constant dog barking. In my dream I felt like it lasted a thousand years and I think it only lasted for a few seconds. When I came out of that nightmare I didn't feel the weight of my dog on my feet. It felt like something was wrong and... I then realized my dog was actually barking and growling. I didn't understand what was happening. I just looked for my dog and saw him on top of the stairs. His head turned towards the front door. The door opening the garage was actually on the side of the front door. I jumped out of my bed and rushed to the top of the stairs where my dog was. There was the shadow of men standing just at the bottom of the stairs next to the front door. I wasn't even able to shout. I just took my dog in my arms by reflex and ran towards my mom's room. My mom was just waking up. She takes medication to sleep so it's very hard to wake her up. 
Thank God, the door of her bedroom can be locked with a key. Even though I was shaking incredibly hard, I locked the door. My mom understood what was happening when we heard footsteps coming from the stairs. We froze in the corner of her bedroom and she grabbed her phone to call the police. While we were trying to reach the cops, the guy started shaking the door handle and then punching the door. After a moment he stopped and this psycho laughed. And that's when my mom and I had the good idea of shouting that we had called the police and for him to get out. After a moment we heard him going down the stairs. It didn't sound as if there was anybody else there and he was still laughing. We didn't dare to move until we heard the police officers. When they arrived, no one was there. In the living room on the table, there was a note where he wrote, See you soon, in French. They said later that apparently the guy had gotten in and out by my garage, which has a back door that at the time was always let open. Immediately after that, we went living with my grandparents for a while and moved out in a new house a couple of months later. We never heard of this guy again, but we always checked every door, making sure that it's locked before going to bed, and I have trouble falling asleep ever since then. For almost a year after, I would wait until about 4am to go to sleep, just to be sure he didn't find us and try to sneak into our home again. When I was in 8th to 10th grade, I was extremely involved in a small building server. The average age was probably 15 to 17 and I joined a group of builders and Skype with them every weekend for hours. We all became close fast and trusted each other enough that we followed each other on Instagram. I became particularly close with one of the builders in my friend group named Peter. Peter was in the same grade as me and we ended up texting quite a lot. I heard rumors that Peter might have a crush on me. He denied them, which I found laughable because it was the internet and brushed it off. Everything was fine for a while until something began to feel off when I talked to him. I was starting to constantly catch him telling small lies. This bothered me, so I figured it was time to distance myself from Peter and stop talking to him. Cut to a few months later of no contact and Peter out of the blue texts me that he's going to be possibly transferring to my high school, so he can get in-state tuition for college. Peter's plan is to somehow live completely alone and support himself while in high school. My stomach drops when I read the text and I know this feels very, very off. I try to be calm and tell him that his plan is crazy. I tell him that it's oddly convenient that he chose my random suburb. Peter insists that his plan will work and it's just a coincidence that he's going to my high school. I'm trying to call Peter's bluff and hoping he's just screwing with me because I cut him off. Peter says he bought the plane tickets already and is going to stay in my town and visit some high schools in the area. Fear washes over me and I realize Peter definitely has some very unhealthy attachment to me. Peter was not bluffing. To my horror, he posts a picture on Snapchat at the airport. Peter asks me to meet up while he's there and I of course decline. Later I see on a Snapchat story that he is taking a tour of my high school. Peter's taking lots of videos and pictures, probably hoping that I can see. Luckily I am stuck at home with pneumonia. I spend the next few days on edge and I'm afraid he was going to ring my doorbell at any moment. Luckily he was not smart enough to find where I live and he flies home and does not follow through with his plan. The baffling part was none of my old group on the Minecraft server thought that he was doing anything creepy. I felt like I was going crazy for thinking that this was weird. I thought my rejection for this meetup and continued no contact would be the end of it but about two years later and I just committed to my dream college. I still stupidly followed Peter on social media because I wanted some warning if he came to my area. Once again Peter did. I see him posting in front of the library at my college with the caption saying, transferring here is definitely the move. Cut to a few months later, Peter finds out I had a boyfriend and directly contacts me for the first time in two years. He starts asking strange questions like, will he protect you? I shouldn't have answered, but for some reason I did. I finally blocked him and stopped following him on social media out of fear. He's not tried to contact me since. Definitely made some mistakes because I was young and scared and had others telling me it was not a big deal.
This happened six years ago. A little info about myself, I'm a 23 year old female and also very small, about 4'11 and weighed 95 pounds soaking wet. My 11th grade year of high school is when this event took place. I was within the first two weeks of school and I was a bus rider, we had a new bus driver. Me being a very social person, I always thanked him for his service and was always super nice to him and I believe that's where I messed up. One day after school I was riding the bus. I was always one of the first to be dropped off so when I realized that I had been on the bus for an extra 10 minutes, I was a little curious and just chalked it up to the fact that bus routes get changed all the time. At this point I've been on the bus for about 30 minutes and there are two kids left on the bus, an old friend of mine and of course myself. This friend of mine lived in a very remote location and there was absolutely no cell service out there so when we dropped her off I couldn't call my parents to let them know what was happening. My friend tried really hard to convince me to get off at her stop. Little did I know I should have listened. As we were leaving this area, the bus driver pulled into a cemetery and told me to look out my window. When I did, I saw a torn to shreds baby deer. My whole body went into shutdown mode. I didn't know what to do. My initial reaction was to pull out my phone and call my parents when I remembered I had no signal. I immediately got up and ran to the back of the bus. Keep in mind, I'm the only kid on this bus. We sit by that deer for a good ten minutes and the whole time I'm in the back and my blood is absolutely boiling. It took everything in me not to run off that bus and look for help. When we started to leave, he just started talking about random stuff, like how he loves his wife and loves his new job as a bus driver. The whole time he's barely paid attention to the road. I get on my phone and go to Google Maps. Thank God that they worked even without service. I realized my house was 15 minutes from where we were and I was super excited to be going home soon. But boy was I wrong. This guy then decides to take a ton of back roads and keep talking to me. The whole time I'm sitting in silence still with no service on my phone. So about 20 to 25 minutes later I start seeing landmarks that are around my neighborhood. I look down and there's service on my phone. I immediately call my dad, he doesn't answer. Not even two minutes later we pull into my neighborhood and he drops me off at my house. I wanted to run but for some reason I just stood in my yard and stared at him, frozen in fear. Eventually he pulled off and when he did I took off running into my house. My parents were in their room freaking out about where I was. My mom started grilling me about where I was and what I was doing. I got out of school at 2.15 and got home at 4.45ish. On a normal day, I would get home at like 2.30, so my mom was very upset. My dad's phone was dead because he tried to call so many times. I began to cry and tell them everything that happened. And my dad was furious and called my school and used my mom's phone to record the whole conversation between my dad, the principal, and myself. My principal was extremely livid about what had taken place, as was my dad. My mother was just cuddling me, asking me if I was okay and if anything else had happened. I didn't go back to school for about two days. There was no formal investigation. The school handled it themselves. The bus driver denied everything and when they checked camera footage, the camera happened to be covered by a sticker or something of the sort. Thankfully, nobody believed the school bus driver and he was fired. And I haven't rode a school bus ever since. This is truly the scariest, most horrible thing that has ever happened to me. I have never been so petrified in my life. To this day, I still do not know who this man was, what he was trying to do, or if he still is where I saw him. I'm sorry for how long the geographical description is. I just want everyone to understand how secluded I was when this happened, and how badly it could have ended if it wasn't for my parents. I was back home for the summer for the first time in a year after starting university. Our home was, and still is, just outside of a small town with forests all around. There was also a small man-made lake, which was diverged from a river that ran for miles through the forest and ramified into a few streams east of the lake. Near my home, there was a small grassy path that led to the river following a stream. It was a long walk 
but one I used to go on often as a child. I knew the forests there well. I knew where I could cut through dense trees to meet the stream. The walk I would go on always led me off the path, which turned northwest slowly, so away from the stream, and then took a sharp turn to the west after a few miles walk, at which point the stream was hidden quite deep into the forest. I'd continue to walk north and follow the stream through the forest to get to the river, then follow the river west to get to the lake. It's easy to get lost in this forest because the terrain isn't just a slope down to the water, it goes up and down, and you end up completely surrounded by trees. I had spent many days wandering around there alone or with my dad over the span of 18 years never saw anybody else in the forest. I went there twice that summer, both times alone-ish. The first time I left in the morning, I walked along the path away from the stream to the sharp bend, then cut back into the forest. I reached the stream after an hour or so. As I was running my hands in the water, I heard a bell from far away, coming from the north. Something was making a bell ring fervently, and periodically, which I found strange. I listened well, wondering if it was a lost hunting dog, and started moving towards the sound. I realized it couldn't have been an animal. I could tell the bell was too heavy because of how clear the sound was to be on a collar. I kept moving and the bell was moving away from me. It stopped completely after five minutes. The stream wasn't big enough or strong enough to carry a bell that could have been enclosed in a tin or something, and the river was too far. Still, I thought of everything, but nothing explained the sound apart from one obvious thing, which I just didn't feel comfortable with for some reason. I knew it had to have been a person. I stopped thinking about it and just walked on normally, until I found a badger, a dead one. The sound of the bell had been following the stream, and so had I. So, the badger was put there while I was walking that way, I suppose. I don't know, really. Nothing else happened that day. One week later, I went back for the second time that summer, and the last time ever. I left home at around 6pm. I made it to the stream, and then walked to the river in an hour then decided to go back the way I came because it was getting late and it was raining quite heavily. The sun set at around 9pm. I was walking as fast as I could. The sound of the rain in the trees was surreal and loud. I was somewhat trotting with my head down for a while, through the clearest and most open part of the forest, when I bumped into something heavy. The smell was sickly. It was the decomposing body of the badger just swinging from a tree. I started gagging. At first, I just stared at it, slightly gobsmacked. Then, I started fidgeting violently. I was soaking from the rain. My senses became confused. It felt like a bucket of ice-cold water had been thrown over me when I realized that I had walked the same way to get to the river. So someone had strung up the body after I had passed it on the way there. Someone knew I would see it. So, was someone watching me and running around the forest? Were the faint sounds of branches breaking around me not animals? I looked around and started jogging. I was half running, half walking away from the stream, back towards the path for a while. When I heard the bell again, I proceeded to call my dad while running. I told him to meet me on the path where it sharply turns west. It was the closest part of the path to me, and to go as fast as he could, because someone was in the forest with me. I can't explain the feeling I had. It was like I just crapped out my intestines and stomach. I literally felt the hairs on my neck raise, despite being soaked. It was dark. I jogged as fast as I could. I was panicking, because the path was still a bit far away just too far to feel safe. It was still raining. Every single sound was muffled. I felt like everything was further away than ever before. The bell went on for a way longer than the last time, on and off. 
I felt like it was surrounding me at one point. The fear combined with my compromised hearing and the fact that I couldn't flipping breathe properly was making me slightly lose my sense of direction. I was automatically heading southwest, but I wasn't really sure what I was even doing. I was breathing like a horse, coughing my lungs up, kind of crying out loud like a toddler does, tripping over leaves and twigs like an idiot. I stayed on the phone with my mom, who was on her way with my dad. I kept hearing sounds, but I wasn't sure what they were. My mom was screaming on the phone at the same time that they were on the path, that I needed to run, that my dad had gotten out and was heading east from the path bend. I was terrified, so I went into survival mode. I was doing the half running, half speed walking thing again, because I was out of breath. Then, I heard branches break, clear footsteps for the first time from down in the forest, and the bell ringing louder. I didn't want to, but I looked over my shoulder. That's when I saw what was in the forest with me, a tall figure creeping in my direction at the very end of the clearing, ringing this bell slowly in front of his stomach. I could tell he was staring straight at me. Now I don't know if I had a hidden secret sprinting ability or instinctual adrenaline induced superhuman powers, but when I tell you I ran for my life, I didn't look back once. I screamed as much as I could. I lied. I'm on the phone with the police. They are on the path. Dad, I can see you. I'm here. I wanted to yell. Dad, please, where are you? But I kept that to myself. I felt like something awful was going to happen. I felt like the man was right behind me. I kept telling myself not to look back. I was gasping and wheezing, crying so hard and screaming for my dad. I felt shivers on my neck. And then, switched off. I just ran. I even dropped my bag and only realized I didn't have it anymore when I was in the car. I felt like my phone was my only way home. Things no longer felt real. It was like my legs were moving by themselves. I didn't know if the man was still following me. I could only hear my heart beating in my ears and the bell. I finally heard my dad shout my name, and I knew he was coming my way and that he could see me because of the intonation of his voice. I pretty much lunged myself at him when we got to each other. My dad heard the bell too. My mom could hear it on the phone. She was waiting with the car ready to leave fast. We went directly to the police station and I got medical attention soon after. My dad burst into tears in the car, said he could hear the bell and thought he wouldn't be able to see me, asked what if I didn't have my phone, what if he hadn't picked me up. They were almost as terrified as me because they witnessed everything through the call. They could hear me trying to run and they could hear the danger, they just couldn't see it. The police couldn't really do much. They searched the area, and the only thing they found was a folded t-shirt placed under a rock. I didn't really question that at the time, and my bag was not recovered. They said it was probably some homeless man living in the forest, but failed to realize what could have happened if my dad didn't know that part of the forest like I did and where to find me. I'm not blaming anyone. The entire thing was my fault. There are just so many what-ifs. I want to believe it was just someone who decided to live in the woods and hunt or something. Maybe they were a bit mentally unstable and they felt angry that I came into their territory. But what if it was more insidious? The way he moved towards me was abnormal. It was perverse because of how slowly he was ringing the bell. It's like he had me trapped. I didn't see any more detail. I just ran. To this day, I can't go anywhere where I'll be alone. And the sound of bells is a real problem. The smell of moss as well. Anyway, my parents and Steve Jobs saved my life. So go hug yours now and take badgers and bells as pagan signs that you are unwelcome. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. 
And if you got a story to submit, submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, to give your cat a soft forehead kiss.